Wendy. She's the most beginner-friendly character in the game. By simply right-clicking on Abigail's flower, she can summon the ghost of her dead sister. Abigail obliterates spiders, frogs, bees, and hounds, which means like 95% of the hostile mobs a new player will encounter are almost a non-issue. Since Abigail can mow down an army of these mobs, starvation is almost impossible as Wendy, since Abigail lets her get stacks of monster meat, frog legs, or even regular meat with just a click of a button. Depending on how many players are on the server, it's possible to get mountains of food by just sitting there and letting Abigail do everything. So Wendy is one of the best, if not THE best character to play as, if you're just trying to survive indefinitely. However, once you get good enough to interact with the more dangerous content of DST, she starts to really fall off. The swamp is full of merms and tentacles, strong enemies that Abigail will struggle to deal with by herself. It's even worse in the ruins. Sure, Abigail is great against the monkeys, but she'll take a lot of damage from knights and bishops, while dead worms and rooks will mop the floor with her. It's even worse when up against seasonal bosses. Abigail stands absolutely no chance against even the weakest bosses in the game. As the challenges get tougher and tougher, Wendy relies on the Abigail less and less, and in this game, the toughest challenges are the raid bosses, also known as major bosses. All of these guys have health pools, damage, and mechanics that make them way more difficult than the average seasonal boss. Abigail alone stands absolutely no chance against these guys, but with the right tactics, prep, and execution, Wendy can beat all of them really quickly. So if you want to know how to clear all the raid bosses, stick around as I recap the all raid bosses rush I did a while back as Wendy. Over a year ago, I made a video called How to be an S tier Wendy. That video is quite outdated at this point, so let me explain the things that I didn't include in that video. First, if you're playing solo as any character, I'd highly recommend installing the mod called Don't Starve Alone. This mod will drastically decrease the load times for starting up an existing world and rolling back. But more importantly, it also lets you animation cancel way faster since it removes input lag. Animation cancelling is very important for boss rushing. Just look at the difference in attack speed between the two. It makes such a huge difference that I think for Beefalo, it increases your character's DPS by 50%. Speaking of Beefalo, Wendy has a special synergy with these guys. Wendy deals 25% less damage than a normal character. However, when she's attacking the same target as Abigail, her damage gets boosted by 54%. This means Wendy attacking with a fresh handbat goes from 45 damage per hit to 68, effectively giving her an infinite dark sword. The thing about Beefalo is that they aren't affected by Wendy's 25% damage debuff but they do benefit from the 54% damage increase that Abigail gives while Wendy is riding them. So instead of an untamed Beeflo dealing 34 damage per hit, it's dealing 52. Instead of an ornery Beeflo dealing 50 damage per hit, it's dealing 77. And instead of an ornery Beeflo with a war saddle dealing 66 damage per hit, it's dealing 102. For most characters, I'd recommend not fighting on a Beeflo, since the characters can often greatly outdamage the Beeflo with the stronger weapons of the game. However, Beeflo is Wendy's unique path to maximizing her potential, so there's no reason to shoot yourself in the foot and not use them. Speaking of maximizing her potential, when I made my S tier Wendy video, the Year of the Bunnymen update hadn't been released yet. Because of this, I didn't have access to the War Saddle. This time, I'll be activating that event so I can use the Deconstruction Staff on the Steel Wool Pillows in order to reach Wendy's maximum damage. That's pretty much it for the character introduction. I'll be fighting on a beefalo using Abigail's damage buff and AoE attacks while boosting her with potions. If you want to learn the specifics about any of those things, I've made several videos on them before. The links are in the description. Once I spawn in, I did what I usually do in all my boss rushes, which is get a bunch of grass and twigs, and at least 3 flint. Since I'm using beefalo, twiggy trees and grass geckos are actually better than the regular sapling and grass tough worlds. So if you really want to give yourself every advantage, then I'd recommend regenerating the world until you get both. After I got those 3 basic resources, I headed to the mosaic biome to get my minerals. While here, I want to obtain a bunch of rocks, flint, and at least 11 gold. The 11 gold will be enough to craft an alchemy engine, a beefalo bell, and the saddle. After getting the gold, I left the mosaic biome in search of beefalo, while making sure to hammer any pig houses that I see along the way, since pigskin is a requirement for both the saddle and the football helmet. After chopping down a couple of trees, I made a science machine and then crafted a backpack, shovel, beefalo bell, and the razor. Then I located the beefalo, bound it to the beefalo bell, and started to feed it with twigs, mushrooms, and carrots. Since this isn't a twiggy tree world, I dig up saplings because I'll need a lot of twigs for this run. While still taming my beefalo with food, I headed to the caves to pick up more carrots and some light bulbs for a lantern. After that, I decided to base in the beefalo savanna, since I wouldn't have to spend extra time digging up grass. After setting down the alchemy engine, I planted all the saplings and then crafted a football helmet, saddle, and a lantern. Now I'm ready to explore the map. I'm on the lookout for the suspicious marble and their set piece, as well as the pan flute and the terrarium. Since I'm doing all the major bosses, I'm also going to be on the lookout for the message in the bottle whenever I'm by a body of water, as well as the lunar islands. Luckily for me, both the knighthead and the chest set piece were located a few screens away from my base. 
As I searched for the other two pieces, I hammered pig houses, destroyed spider dens for silk, and got some living logs from the totally normal trees. I eventually found the rook nose in the pig king biome and brought it to the set piece. While I searched for the bishop head, I also happened across a message in a bottle off the shore of the mosaic, and I helped out a bunch of pip spooks for morning glories. I also got at least 18 marble and I found the terrarium. On day 8 I finally found the bishop head in the swamp and had all the pieces assembled by day 9. On day 10 I made a bunch of crockpots, a presti, and made the marble armor, beekeeper hats, and tall scotch eggs that I will be using against Bee Queen. Bee Queen is probably the matchup that Wendy is most famous for, since Abigail counters her rumblebees pretty nicely. I'm fighting Bee Queen on day 11 in order to take advantage of the full moon, meaning Abigail will be doing night damage without any of the dangers of fighting in darkness. I'm using 3 potions for this fight, Nightshade Nostrum, Spectral Cure-All, and Revenant Restorative. Nightshade Nostra makes Abigail deal her maximum damage for a day, so this is the potion that I applied to her before the fight. I have a handbat as my weapon, 3 sets of marble armor, 2 beekeeper hats, and 3 tall scotch eggs for heals. After one third of the game day has gone by, I feed my beeflo 2 steam twigs to keep it taming after I dismount it, and hammer the hive to start the fight. Bee Queen has 4 phases. In phase 1, she'll spawn up to 5 grumble bees and fly right up to you to attack. I set Abigail to aggressive in this phase, since the Bee Queen won't target her unless Wendy really distances herself from the Queen. I fight Bee Queen on the Bee Flow, since the Bee Flow will eventually recover from all the damage, due to its passive regeneration. Abigail is dealing 40 damage per hit, so she's not only helping out quite a bit against Bee Queen, but more importantly, she's killing all the Grumble Bees in 5 seconds. Once the bottom of my screen turns red, or Wendy makes a comment about the Beeflo's health being low, I dismount and fight the Queen on foot. With the marble armor and beekeeper hats, Bee Queen is only doing 3 damage to Wendy per stick, and her grumbles are doing less than 1 damage, so Wendy's health isn't really the concern of the fight. The concern is all about keeping Abigail alive. Once Bee Queen's health dips below 3 quarters, she enters into phase 2. In this phase, she spawns double the amount of grumbles, which for many characters is a pretty big deal, but for Wendy it's really no different than phase 1. With the fresh handbat, Wendy is doing 45 damage by herself and 68 damage with Abigail. When you add the damage Abigail is dishing out, Wendy is essentially doubling her damage when attacking Bee Queen with Abigail. Not only that, but when Wendy is next to Abigail, she gets protected by the AoE, so it's extremely important to always be next to Abigail when attacking the Queen. Since the marble armor drastically reduces movement speed, I unequip it while moving and put it back on right before I'm about to get hit. After Bee Queen's health dips to half, she enters phase 3 and 4. I immediately set Abigail to passive. In these two phases, Bee Queen will scream, which sends all her grumbles flying at super speed towards Wendy. This is actually a good thing, because when this is happening, the bees will not target Abigail. However, Bee Queen will attack her if Abigail is attacking the Queen and you are not, or if you're not in the Queen's range. This is why I immediately set Abigail to passive. These two phases are a little more tricky than phase 1 and 2. Basically, if Bee Queen is right in my face, I just stay near Abigail and swing away. If Bee Queen moves away from Wendy, and there aren't many Grumble Bees, my goal is to run up to Bee Queen and land a hit before any of her Grumble Bees hit me. If I can do this, then Abigail will move herself right onto Bee Queen, which lets me just stand in place and smack away. If the Grumble Bees hit me before I can land the first hit on Bee Queen, then Abigail will try to attack the Grumble Bees, which means there's a good shot that she won't be centered on Bee Queen. moves away from me and there are a lot of bees blocking the path, or if she spawns a bunch before I can get to her, I fall back to Abigail and start smacking away at them, until there are only a few left. After that I quickly run to Bee Queen and start smacking away. Phase 4 is the same as Phase 3, except Bee Queen will scream more frequently, which is actually good since she doesn't move while screaming and none of her grumbles attack Abigail. At the very end of the fight, Abigail gets hit by Bee Queen, which puts her HP in the double digits. At this point, I apply Spectral Cure All to her, which rapidly restores her HP back to full. From there, I kill the next wave of Grumbles and finish off Bee Queen with a couple of smacks. With that, Bee Queen is dead, and I am rewarded with the Bee Queen Crown, 6 Royal Jelly, and the Bundling Wrap Blueprint. All items that would be very useful throughout the run. On day 12, I turned the Royal Jelly into Jelly Beans, got more Morning Glories, made a Golden Axe, a Wooden Gate, and Vigor Mortis, and then headed to the caves. In the caves, I have three objectives. The first is to pull off the typical Ruins Rush, the second is to obtain the 8 Fossil Fragments, and the third is to find Toadstool. While trying to stock up on light bulbs, I found Toadstool in the Muddy Biome Spawner. After that, I flew past the Wilds and into the Ruins. Then I mined a few statues and made a Thulocyte Medallion at one of the Broken Stations. 
Since the Ancient Guardian's loot got buffed a while back, there's a good chance that everything I'll need will be in the large ornate chest. So I head over to AG and start the fight. The potion I'm using for this one is Vigor Mortis. Vigor Mortis increases Abigail's speed to the point that she's moving about 45% faster than the default. This is required for the AG fight since it allows her to somewhat keep up with the beefalo and get behind the obstacles that AG runs into. Since we're in the caves, Abigail is doing her nighttime damage. Combine that with the 52 damage per hit that the beefalo is doing, and Wendy is dealing more damage than a Dark Sword. Everyone knows about AG. He has 10,000 HP, will charge at you from a distance, or bite you if you get too close. Dodging this guy is easy with beefalo speed, and light isn't an issue since I can fight while holding the lantern in my hand slot. Unlike the Bee Queen fight, I'm using animation cancelling, which lets me attack way faster than I do by just holding F. Ideally, I'd like to swap my hand slot item to animation cancel, however I need the lantern for the fight, so I swap the Bee Queen crown instead. Once AG reaches phase 2, he starts spawning shadow tentacles at random, and gains a jump attack. It's more difficult than the first phase, but nothing to write home about. I just run in the opposite direction I was moving in when he starts to jump, and get out of there if Abigail or I am getting smacked by tentacles. After AG is dead, I run around the chest to trigger any dormant tentacles and then grab the loot. I got a lazy explorer, a bunch of Thutocyte, and all three of the rare gem types. Since the ruins generation was messed up, the labyrinth was connected to the red mushroom forest. I needed a bunch of nightmare fuel, so while I waited for nightmare phase, I mined a bunch of spelagmites to get fossil fragments. Once nightmare phase started, I mass murdered monkeys to get tons of nightmare fuel and bananas. Then I cleared the two bishops from the completed station, crafted two starcaller staffs, a magi, a deconstruction staff, and a pickaxe, and then headed to the surface. Back up top, it was only day 17, so I had 4 days before winter starts. Using the deconstruction staff, I destroyed 2 of the steel wool pillows that the bunny men were using, and used that to make the war saddle. It was barely day 18, so I decided to test out the saddle on the second raid boss that we'll be fighting, Dragonfly. So after prototyping walls and grabbing the pan food, I headed to the Dragonfly Desert. As per usual, I set up 12 walls corner to corner off of both sides of the furthest lava pond from the center. Then I swapped the regular saddle for the war saddle, applied Vigor Mortis to Abigail, and started the fight. Dragonfly has 27,500 HP, which is a lot. However, we're also doing a lot of damage. The war saddle boosts the beefalo's damage by 16, so this untamed beefalo is dealing 50 damage per hit. However, with Abigail's damage boost, its 50 damage gets boosted to 77, which means it's hitting way harder than a Dark Sword. If you add Abigail's damage, it's as if Wendy is doing around 90 damage per hit during dusk and 97 at night. Now if I took things a little slower, I could have waited until my beefalo is fully tamed to fight Dragonfly. Had I done this, it would have been doing 102 damage per hit, and combined with Abigail's night damage, Wendy would have been hitting for around 120 damage with each attack. In other words, once this beefalo fully tames, I'm hitting as hard as Mighty Wolfgang. The damage that Wendy dishes out is so severe that with animation cancelling, she can stun Dragonfly even if Abigail isn't dealing her max damage. As for the actual fight in this run, the typical cutting pattern for Dragonfly is to hit it 6 times and then dodge. However, since I have the super speed of Beefalo, and I'm using animation cancelling, I'm able to get up to 8 hits in between slaps. Since I'm dealing so much damage, phase 1 goes by extremely quickly. After her health gets down to 22,500, Dragonfly goes to spawn Lavid. Instead of running to the outside of the wall, I use the Beefalo's super speed to chase her down and deal extra damage to her. Since I applied the speed potion to Abigail, she's able to keep up with the Beefalo and therefore continues to boost Wendy's damage. After 3 lava are spawned, I run back to the outside of the wall and wait for Dragonfly to finish. Once she crosses over, I re-engage her, getting 7 to 8 hits in before dodging. The lava will try to get to Wendy, but their pathing doesn't recognize the lava ponds as obstacles, so they spend their entire lives stuck on the inside of the lava pond. The lava will slowly die off. And after the last one dies, Dragonfly will enter in rage or she will immediately go back to spawn more lava. If she goes back to spawn more lava, I just chase her down to deal free damage and run back once she only has a few more to spawn.
Dragonfly enrages, then I wait for her to do her triple stomp attack and then blow the pan flute. The pan flute puts her to sleep and takes her out of enrage. From there, I just re-engage her with the same cutting pattern as before. Since I'm chasing down Dragonfly to deal extra damage, animation cancelling and hitting so hard, Dragonfly dies in a little over 5 minutes. It's now day 19, so I still have a lot of time before winter. Since the Moonstone was on the way back to base, I used some of my time to build a wall around it in order to help with obtaining the Mooncaller staff. The next day I caught all the butterflies that I'll need for Pearl and started to work on the other materials that I'd need for the rest of her chores. Since day 21 is the new moon, I will be fighting the shadow pieces come night time. So after completing the sculptures, I fed my beefalo a ton of food and mined the knight statue to start the fight. The order that we'll be fighting the pieces is the usual, knight, bishop, and then rook. The level 1 knight goes down fast since it only has 800 HP and Abigail is doing knight damage. Once the other two pieces level up, the real fight begins. Both deal a decent amount of damage to Abigail and I want her to stick around for at least the majority of phase 2. This is why I applied a Revenant Restorative to her, so that her healing gets boosted which keeps her in the fight longer. For the Shadow Pieces, speed is more valuable than power, therefore I'm using the regular saddle instead of the War Saddle. After doing my best to dodge both the Rook and Bishop's attacks, the Bishop is defeated and the Rook levels up to 3. This phase is actually easier than the last one. All I do is attack the Rook as many times as I can, and then run when I see him about to teleport. I run back and forth in order to try and keep the fight centered around the Dwarf Star, so I can benefit from the heat and light. If I wasn't using animation cancelling, Wendy would be getting about 6 hits on the Rook in between attacks. However, animation cancelling lets me get 9 or even 10 hits on the Rook when he doesn't howl, which just goes to show how good animation cancelling is. I really need the boosted DPS because I can't use Abigail in this fight since she died instantly which means I'm only dealing a mere 34 damage per hit. It's extremely important that I do not use the War Shadow against the level 3 Rook, because the B-Flow is simply too slow with it to dodge the teleports. Since my beeflow isn't fully tamed, I have to get off at least one time during the fight. This is the entire reason for feeding it a ton of food beforehand. By filling its hunger, the beeflow's obedience drains at a much slower pace, which means I don't have to worry about it not letting me ride when I want to get back on. After quite a long fight, the Rook goes down on day 22. With Dragonfly, Bee Queen, and the Shadow Pieces defeated, there are only two more raid bosses on the mainland that I have to beat. Klaus doesn't spawn until day 23, but the no eyed deer certainly have, so I head out in search of the deer while bringing along the terrarium. Fortunately, I find them almost immediately after heading into the picking biome. Since it was almost night, I placed the terrarium down, activated it, and swapped to the war saddle. Once the twins are summoned, I put them to sleep with the pan flute, position Abigail so that she's closer to spasmatism, set her to aggressive and start attacking spaz, while leading it away from Redenazer. Since Abigail is set to aggressive, she'll keep her distance from Wendy even if Wendy moves a bit away from her. Because of this, I am able to keep Abigail alive in the fight, as long as spasmatism is targeting me, since I can just fight it on the opposite side of Abigail. As long as the twin is focused on me, it will dash in the opposite direction of Abigail which prevents her from getting hit. Abigail is great since she not only increases Wendy's damage, but her AoE means I pretty much don't have to worry about the suspicious peepers since they get destroyed whenever they get near me. My B-Flow is on the verge of becoming fully tamed, but it's not quite there yet, so I'm still dealing the 77 damage per hit, which is great, but definitely a step down from what I will be doing when Wendy reaches her max potential. Since keeping the twins focused on myself is so important, I play really aggressive, which ends with me getting hit a few times, a trade-off that's definitely worth it. After fighting almost the entire night, 
Spasmatism dies, which means it's just Red Nazer and Kloss left before I head to the caves. I use the next day to search the whole Pig King biome, and part of the mosaic for the loot stash, but no luck. My beefalo fully tames right before nighttime, which means from now on I'm dealing Wolfgang damage. After swapping to the War Saddle and activating the Terrarium, Night Falls and Red Nazer spawns. With Abigail's buff, I'm dealing 102 damage per hit, and since it's nighttime, Abigail's doing 40 damage, making this fight go by really quickly. Unfortunately, Red Nazer decided to switch its target to Abigail, which gets her killed. I think this might have to do with Abigail attacking one of the suspicious peepers before it hatched. Anyway, Red Nazer's health was really low at this point, so I just finish it off by myself. Minutes after the twins fight, I was able to find the loot stash. Since Abigail was defeated, it's going to take her two days to get back to her max HP. Right now I'm pressed for time. So I decided to fight Kloss without her. Kloss is the easiest out of all the raid bosses, so it's not like Abigail is needed. However, the damage boost she provides would make the fight go by much quicker. If you want to see a Kloss fight using Abigail, I have it linked in the description. So after inserting the deer antler into the loot stash, Kloss is summoned. Although I don't have Abigail, my fully tamed ornery beef flow with the war shadow is still doing dark sword damage, so the fight isn't a long one. To combat Kloss, I attack him once, then dodge his swipes, attack him again, then dodge his swipes again. After that he will either do his fire spell or ice spell. If it's the fire spell, I continue to attack him and then dodge once the spell is complete. If it's the ice spell, I immediately run around him on the side of the blue gem deer when I see the spell begin to cast and then attack him. Once his health dips below 5000, Kloss summons Krampus, which I kill by attacking once and then dodging over and over. Once Kloss's HP goes to zero, he dies but gets revived soon after as we enter into phase two. Kloss will do the exact same thing as he did in phase one, except he will do a pounce attack and he will scream from time to time. Since the beef flow has super speed, dodging the pounce attack is as simple as running in the opposite direction. After a three and a half minute fight, Kloss is down for good. The bundle wraps didn't really have anything that I'd use, so I just picked up the gold and wax paper and then headed to base to prepare for the cave bosses. At base, I cooked a few tall scotch eggs for health, meat stew for hunger, and bundled the shadow atrium, fossil fragments, sandy food, meat for a ham bat, and gems for toadstool. After that, I headed to the caves. The first cave boss that I will be fighting is toadstool. Toadstool is by far the tankiest boss in the run, and he gets even more tanky when he summons spore caps. The usual way to deal with him is to get a bunch of weather paints to quickly destroy his trees and get either a ton of strong weapons or get a morning star and fight him while the caves are wet. I'm using a different approach. So once I'm ready, I drop off my perishables in the piggyback far away from the arena and chop the mushroom to start the fight. For Wendy, Beeflo are really good against Toadstool. Abigail is always doing her max damage in the caves, so combined with the War Saddle Ornery Beeflo, Wendy is doing roughly 120 damage per hit. The best thing is that unlike weapons such as Dark Swords or Thuthusite Clubs, Beeflo can attack an infinite amount of times, so I'm basically Mighty Wolfgang with a fresh hand bat that never spoils. In Phase 1, I want to attack Toadstool while leading it towards the outside of the pond that is closest to the center of the arena. After 45 seconds of fighting, Toadstool will start to walk back for 15 seconds. During this time, it won't attack me at all, which lets me get a ton of free hits on it. Once the 15 seconds are up, Toadstool will begin to summon Spore Caps. It will usually spawn a total of 8, but sometimes it bugs out and spawns less. 
I continue to attack Toadstool until it has summoned 4. After that, I swap to the Fire Staff and start lighting all but one on fire. The one that is not on fire should be in the direction that I want Toadstool to go to. After it's done spawning trees, Toadstool will be really fast. I use this to my advantage and lure it to the outside of the arena, and then pan flute it to sleep. Once it's asleep, I dismount my beefalo and chop down the spore cap that isn't burning. A fully powered Toadstool is very dangerous, because it's really fast, has 80% damage reduction, and attacks very frequently. By chopping down this one tree, I've dropped Toadstool to level 2, where it's far less of a threat, and its damage reduction is only at 40%, so I can deal a ton of damage to it while I wait for the rest of the trees to burn. So after getting back on the beefalo, I begin to attack it again, while keeping it as far as possible from the inside of the arena and leading it away from the burning spore caps. Eventually, all the spore caps will burn, which depowers Toadstool, and a bit after that, Toadstool will begin slowly walking back to the center for 15 seconds before spawning more. Once it does this, I just repeat what I did the first time, continue to attack it until it has 4 trees, then start lighting all but one of them on fire with the fire staffs. This time Toadstool bugged out and only summoned 5 trees instead of 8. So instead of putting it to sleep and chopping the last tree down, I don't need to do any of that. I just immediately start attacking it while leading it away from the burning trees. Fire staffs have two downsides compared to weather panes. The first is that they take 45 seconds to destroy a spore cap, while weather panes destroy them instantly. The second is that burned spore caps leave a spore cloud that lingers on for a long time. However, this doesn't really matter since every time I fight Toadstool, I'm leading it away from the burning trees, and by the time I come back to the area, the spore clouds are all gone. On the third cycle, Toadstool enters phase 3. This phase is much more dangerous because the double stomps can hit Abigail if I don't kite early, so that's something I just need to be aware of. I get lucky once again as Toadstool only summons 6 spore caps this time, meaning I don't have to put it to sleep or hop off my beeflow to chop down a tree. I haven't mentioned this, but the potion that I'm using for this fight is Vigor Mortis. It allows Abigail to kite Toadstool's boom shrooms and double stomps much easier, as well as get to Toadstool to deal damage faster. Although I mentioned in my S tier Wendy guide that I use Revenant Restorative, I think Vigor Mortis is actually the way to go against Toad. Anyways, that's pretty much the Toadstool fight. I just repeatedly light the spore caps on fire, put Toadstool to sleep, and then chop down the last one, and then fight him while luring him away and keeping Abigail alive. After a little over 8 minutes, Toadstool finally keels over. I then collected the loot and headed over to Nightmare Warpig, a boss that I didn't cover in my Wendy Boss Rush guide, since he wasn't out at the time. After freeing the pig, dropping my beefalo bell far away from the fight, and killing the shadelings, the fight is started. Taking on this guy while riding a beefalo is pretty risky. The pig will knock me off the beefalo if it hits me with its body slam. It's a pretty big issue in phase 1, since by the time I get back on the beefalo, he'll probably be ready to hit me again. However, it's much worse in phase 2, since he follows up his body slams immediately with a ground smash. The ground smash is an AoE attack, and if it hits my beef flow while I'm dismounted, this will cause my beef flow to aggro onto the pig. While aggroed, my beef will not let me ride, which means it will almost certainly get itself killed. This is the reason I dropped the bell far away from the arena before starting. That way, if I do get knocked off, the beef flow will instantly run to the bell, preventing it from getting hit while I'm dismounted. However, all of that is worst case scenario. I don't have to worry about that happening if I don't get hit by the body slam. So using the beef flow super speed, I dodge the pig 3 times and then smack away once he's huffing. The Nightmare Werepig has an extremely strong insanity aura, however the Bee Queen Crown reverses it, 
meaning I end up getting a ton of sanity from the fight. Since I'm playing as Wendy, I'm not just worried about dodging the pig's attacks, but I also have to make sure Abigail doesn't get hit, so she can massively increase my DPS. To stop the Nightmare Werepig from hitting her, I kite in a V-shaped pattern, getting some distance from Abigail and then running not to the side of the pig, but behind him. It's okay if I get hit by contact damage, because it won't knock me off the beefalo. To further ensure Abigail doesn't die, I use the Revenant Restorative Potion on her to triple her regeneration. Once his HP drops below 5000, Nightmare Werepig enters phase 2, where he does his ground smash attack. At this point, I put Abigail away and bait him into destroying all three of the pillars. Once the pillars are gone, I resummon Abigail and fight him again. Fighting on a beefalo is risky, but it does have one upside, which is that the beefalo is completely unaffected by the sinkholes the pig creates. Anyways, I pretty much fight him by running behind him when he's trying to punch, while trying my best to keep him near the dwarf star. After his HP drops below 3000, he enters phase 3, which is identical to phase 1, except he does his ground smashes in addition to the body slams. Since I'm dealing so much damage, the Nightmare Wear Pig is defeated in less than 3 minutes. After that, it's Fuiver time. I headed to the ruins to get the Thulocyte crowns, and once I had everything, I cheated myself into the void and started searching for the atrium. Typically, I would know where the atrium is based on the location of the atrium bridge. However, this wasn't an option for this run, because ruins generation was messed up. So I had to search for it blind, which causes me to lose almost an entire day. After I finally find it, I teleported into the arena, built the correct statue, maxed out my sanity, and organized my inventory. The Fuel Weaver fight is probably the most complicated fight for Wendy, and I made an entire video that explains how to do it in detail, so if you really want to learn how to do it, I recommend watching that one. Once I'm ready, I insert the Shadow Atrium to start. I immediately eat 3 Cactus to restore my sanity and a Jelly Bean so I can passively heal from all the hits I'll be tanking. In the first phase, all I do is stand away from Abigail on the outside of the arena and deal as much damage as I can with animation cancelling. I'm also keeping an eye on Abigail's health, because the number one priority in this fight is keeping Abigail alive. Once Abigail's health dips to about 150, I apply a Spectral Cure All potion to her. Soon after this, I brought Fuiver to under 10,000 HP, which causes him to enter phase 2. When I see its shield go up, I immediately run away from him, chug a few cactus to restore my sanity, and start smacking the hidden hands. Usually I would set Abigail to aggressive around this time, however I didn't have to since Fuiver didn't immediately summon Woven Shadows. So I'm able to quickly kill all the hidden hands before he's able to heal up a lot. After killing the last hidden hand, I position Abigail so that she's centered onto him, and starts backing away again while tanking all of his hits. Abigail isn't only greatly boosting Wendy's DPS, but her huge rapid fire AoE attack also kills all the woman shadows that try to crawl to Fuiver, which effectively nullifies his healing mechanic. After 20 seconds, he goes invincible again, and I run around the arena destroying all the hidden hands except for one of them. Once all but one are destroyed, I wait until Fuiver begins to spawn the Woven Shadows, and only at this time do I smack the last hand and start to attack Fuiver once more. By waiting until Fuiver summons his minions, Abigail is able to destroy all of them, or very close to it, before Fuiver becomes invincible. With Abigail's damage buff, Wendy is doing Dark Sword damage with her fresh handbat, factoring in the animation cancelling and Abigail's night damage, and I'm able to do almost 4000 damage to Fuel Weaver per cycle. Once he again goes invincible, it's just a repeat of last time. I destroy all the hidden hands except for one, restore my sanity with Cooked Cactus and my health with pierogies, or another Jelly Bean. I'm also trying to position Abigail so that she doesn't get hit by Fuiver, and once her HP gets below 200, I apply another Spectral Cure All to her.
After a little over 3 minutes, Fuelweaver is defeated which means I've beaten all the mainland raid bosses. This guy is by far the hardest, but also the funnest fight for Wendy. So in my opinion, this right here is the highlight of the run. I brought the Dreadstone with me, so I decided to hand it over to Charlie, because it's always cool to see this cutscene. However, I ended up regretting this a bit later in the run, because Acid Raiden is bad, especially during Spring. Since it's day 31, I need to do the Moonstone event, so I hop on my beefalo to get back to the void and get out of the caves as fast as possible. The cave entrance wasn't close, but it also wasn't really far from the Moonstone, so I continued to head over there as fast as I could. I arrived with most of the night gone, so I quickly placed the Star Caller, swapped to the War Saddle, and got ready for the Horde. I was so glad I built the walls earlier because I don't think I would have been able to pull this off if I hadn't. Abigail is pretty good for this event since her rapid fire AoE attacks hits everything that tries to pass through the opening. While she draws the attention of everything she hits, I quickly pick off the stronger enemies one by one. After the star caller transforms, the floor is littered with meat and pigskin, and I claim the new moon caller staff as my prize. After that, I mine the petrified mobs for moon rocks, mine boulders for regular rocks, destroyed hound mounds for teeth, chop down trees for logs, killed spiders for silk, and used the bone helm to fight nightmares for fuel. Later I went to the caves and got some light bulbs, killed a bunch of beefalo for their wool, and caught fireflies. All of these resources are things I needed for Pearl's chores. On day 35, I paddled as fast as I could to Pearl's Island. On the way, I got extremely lucky by encountering a bunch of salt formations. For me, the salt formations are the make or break RNG of these kinds of runs, so finding them this early is a huge W. After getting to Pearl's Island, I used the telelocator staff to make it snow and handed her the dapper vest for the first point of friendship. Using the 10 butterflies I was carrying all winter, I planted 10 flowers around her bee box. Then I planted and fertilized 8 berry bushes, hung the kelp on her drying racks, and then spent the rest of the night killing cookie cutters for their shells. The next day I completed the first two upgrades of her house, however I didn't bring enough grass for the ropes, so I lost the day settling back to the mainland to grab more. After I got back, Abigail killed the lure plant while I picked the flowers I planted to make a pretty parasol and handed it to Pearl since it was raining. Then I completed upgrading Pearl's house. The next day I used a pinch and winch to collect all the garbage around the island, and on day 39 I was finally rewarded with Pearl's Pearl. Pearl's chores are probably the most annoying thing in this run, but even with them out of the way, there's still a ton of things to do before I can get to CC. The next thing on the list is to go to Lunar Island and mine all the celestial altar pieces. I had a pretty good idea where Lunar Island was, so I paddled directly there with the same grass raft I was using. After arriving, I mined all the altars, assembled them at what I think is the best spot, and once I was done, I used the telelocator staff to teleport me off the island and back to the mainland. After getting back to base, I prepared for the next thing that I needed to do, which is obtain the astral detectors from the archives. So after deconstructing the Mooncaller staff, I headed to the caves. Since the ruins generation was messed up, I ended up near a bunch of bishops that I quickly killed for purple gems. After escaping the ruins, I found the archives, and while I was trying to clear the boulders, the cave started acid raining, so I had to be really fast. After activating the archives and locating the right fountain of knowledge, I solved the puzzle, got enough materials for two detectors, and exited the caves before the rain could get me. I spent about a day and a half finding the two Sanctum pieces. One was right next to my base, while the other one was on the complete opposite side of the map. After finding both pieces, I decided to kill Mooskoos for a luxury fan. Now that all the Sanctum pieces were found, the Astral Detectors would lead me to Crab King's location. Unfortunately, this guy was located on the complete opposite end of the map, and there were no good wormholes around there. After finding Crab King, I cleared out the rock formations on one side and made another raft. Then I socketed the pearl and 8 purple gems, and immediately unwrapped the bundle wrap that contained 40 killer bees, then teleported to the other raft. Ideally, I should have either brought a pan flute to put the bees to sleep, or kept the second raft much further away. Because I didn't do either, a lot of the bees were aggroed onto me instead of Crab King. Luckily, I paddled away while summoning Abigail, who took care of all of them. From here on, the fight was pretty straightforward. I just kept myself close enough to Crab King so that he doesn't use his freeze attack, and paddled from side to side whenever the geysers appeared under the boat. Since I had to kill a bunch of my bees, Crab King doesn't die as quickly as I'd like, but he ends up going down in 5 minutes. Once dead, I set Abigail to aggressive to take care of all the killer bees, and I retrieved the Celestial Tribute with the Pinch and Winch, and bring it all the way back to base. I spent the next day and a half moving all the pieces to Lunar Island, and on the night of day 52, I was able to finally activate the Moonstorms. 
The first Moonstorm was literally in the middle of my base. Wendy is really good at dealing with Moonstorms since Abigail just takes out all the birds, which allows Wendy to help Wagstaff and get all the other materials she needs in peace. I would recommend applying Vigor Mortis to her since sometimes she's just not fast enough to hit all the birds if they come at you in all directions. After helping out Wagstaff three times, I have everything I need to fight the Celestial Champion. For the CC fight, I'm going to be using the War Saddle Ornery B flow, and Abigail will be under the effects of Vigor Mortis. Like basically all the other boss fights, the main goal is to keep Abigail alive, which isn't extremely difficult in at least phases 1 and 2. In phase 1, all I do is dodge CC's flopping attack a little early. I think I usually get around 9 hits in if I'm animation cancelling. The rolling attack is the more dangerous one. It'll change directions 3 times, so I try to get as much distance as I can and run perpendicular to its path. Abigail is immune to gestalts, so I just dodge the gestalt attack the way I normally do. Since I've beaten Fuel Weaver already, I don't have to worry about Enlightenment due to the Bone Helm setting it to zero. The Beeflow also blocks 100% of damage, so unless my Beeflow dies, there's no risk of the Bone Helm breaking mid fight. After draining its health to zero, CC goes to phase 2. In this phase, it can basically one-shot Abigail with its blender attack. All I need to do to avoid it is to dodge early. However, due to the wall that CC created, I am unable to get Abigail out of the line of fire fast enough, and she ends up getting killed. After this, it's just a standard CC fight. I could resummon Abigail at no cost other than time, but she'd just instantly die since I don't have any more Vigor Mortis potions on me. With Abigail out of commission, the fight is longer, but also much easier since I don't have to divide my attention between the two of us. Once phase 2 is drained to zero, CC goes into its final and most ridiculous form. I call it ridiculous because it can just sit on top of its spires and runs away from you, which can make it really frustrating to hit. Even if I didn't mess up in phase 2 and get Abigail killed, she wouldn't have lasted long in phase 3 anyway. The lasers deal massive damage to her and hit two times in a row, and CC's close range attack hits so quickly that it stuns Abigail preventing her from moving. Even if Abigail was constantly under the effects of Spectral Cure-All, I don't think I'd be able to keep her alive in phase 3, unless I repeatedly took breaks from the fight, or unsummoned her. That sounds like a really expensive and tedious solution, so I recommend in phase 3, don't worry about Abigail, let her die, and then fight CC without her. This is easily the most dangerous phase, since it can deal massive damage to the beeflow if it gets hit by multiple lasers crossing over each other. Another thing that can spell game over for Wendy is if I somehow get caught up in the Gestalt attack, or if I get put to sleep by the spires. If this happens, Wendy will dismount the beeflow and go to sleep. Guess what happens to a beeflow when Wendy is sleeping? It gets lasered and dies. So the priority is to not get hit by lasers, but you really don't want to get hit by multiple lasers when they cross over or get put to sleep. Other than that, it's pretty much the same as fighting this boss as Wilson. Dodge the lasers by creeping a little diagonally and try to bait the boss into destroying the spires. Animation cancelling makes a big difference in this fight, since the increased attack speed stuns CC enough that it sort of prevents it from moving.
I don't think I took a single hit in phases 1 and 2. However, I know I'm probably going to get hit a bunch in phase 3. So when I feel like my B-Flow is low on HP, I run out of the fight and heal it up with the blue caps I've been saving. B-Flow get 4 times the health from healing foods, so each mushroom is healing it for 80 HP. Although CC is one of the two final bosses, I consider it way easier than Fuel Weaver, solely because you can exit the fight and come back to it at any time. After a fight that lasted over a day, CC dies on day 58. With CC finally dead, we've beaten all the major bosses in the game. That's Bee Queen, Dragonfly, The Shadow Pieces, Twins of Terror, Boss, Toadstool, Ancient Fuel Weaver, Crab King, and Celestial Champion. All beaten at the earlier part of summer, but most importantly with everyone's favorite character Wendy. I think this run really highlights why the Celestial Champion route sucks. The first 30 days of this game are action packed and fun, because I'm fighting boss after boss. However, once Fuel Weaver is beaten, I spent 25 days of chores just to fight CC. Not saying it wasn't fun, but if I had to choose between the two, I'll take Fuel Weaver over Celestial Champion any day. Anyways, that's all for the video. For anyone who's brave enough to watch this entire thing to the end, I want to say, like always, thanks for watching, take care, and have a great day.